Okay, I think we're live, near as I can tell. Uh, so I want to um, say welcome to our network members. Uh, we're really excited to do this first Google Hangout. We hope it's going to become a, a regular part of our connecting, reaching out, using this new technology. And it's a real honor to be doing it with my friend and it is really nice after all the work we've been through to say he is my friend, David Gibson. Um, so we were uh, the collaborators to create this, Nuns on the Bus, uh, and many of you have seen it, some of you have read it, we've heard uh, from a lot of you around the country, so it's an amazing experience to have a book and to have it out there. Um, we're also really grateful that it's been a way to get network known and to get our message and mission known in a broader perspective. So um, I'm grateful for the chance to talk to you today. A bunch of you have sent in questions, some of that we will try to respond to. Um, but a number of you have said, well, how did you find this man, David Gibson? And uh, the, the short answer is, is that our editor, Roger Freet, uh, at Harper One, had this idea to that we could work together, that we would be a good partnership. So I call Roger the matchmaker, and that he did very, uh, very well in putting us together. I also teased during the process, saying that we had an arranged marriage. Now, David did point out that it was temporary, so we had to adjust it to say that we had an arranged fling. But then that sounded just all wrong. So. Um, what we did was this collaboration where we went back and forth, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I've asked David to share a little bit about that experience from his perspective. But I must say, it, there would never have been a book without his collaboration and without Roger's insight that the two of us could work together. So it's kind of uh, an exciting moment to have this book out there. It's a little scary, um, but it is all so a great opportunity to let our message, mission, be known in a bigger sphere. So, David, why don't you introduce yourself and tell them about your day job and uh, <laughs> what you do, what you actually do, and then a little bit about doing this project together. It's true. What, what I actually do is um, journalism, religion journalism. I'm a national correspondent at Religion News Service. You can go to religionnews.com after this Google Hangout, not before, and check out what we write. And I, I cover the Catholic Church for a lot of... Uh, long-standing reasons. Um, for one thing, I, I used to work over at uh, Vatican Radio way back in the late 1980s. Um, my dark secret is I'm a convert to Catholicism at the age of 30 when I should have known better and after having worked at the Vatican when I really should have known better. <laughs> but um, it's been a blessing to me and um, and it's working out pretty well these days. And then Simone, so it's like, it seemed for like a decade there you know, I'd tell people I was a convert to Catholicism, and they'd say, why did you do that? And now, since the election of Francis, um, it's been, hey, that's really cool. Tell me about that, you know? So between Francis and Sister Simone, I think we're back on the uptick. Um, and I, um, in fact, I brought along my, um, my <laughs> bobblehead as a little good luck charm. Love this. Every time I go to Rome, pick one up for the gang. Um, no, I also did... Uh, yeah, I'd written a couple of books about the Catholic Church uh, for Harper Harper One, a division of Harper Collins, and Roger Freak, great editor there, wanted to do this book with Simone and contacted me, and you know, essentially said she needed a ghostwriter, and and afterwards I said I was more like a holy ghostwriter. Um, it was such an edifying thing, really, truly, and um, it's also her story. You know, it's um, it's I was just the uh, I was just the channel here, mm -hmm. so I. Um, you know, it was it was a new experience for me. He said, you know, just you need some help on. She needs help mainly. As Simone's a great writer. She's just so darn busy and running around and doing the great work that she does. That I think she needs somebody really to collect and organize her sometimes scattered but always wonderful thoughts. And that was my chief role. And um, you know, we can we can talk more later. We had some. We had a great time. Uh, it was very busy. It this happened the same year that Pope Francis was elected, so it was a busy year for all of us. <laughs> yes. but the, um, you know, I had a great time. We have great stories about collaborating and some of the, um, the very funny things. It's the thing I get. The last thing I'll leave you with before we go into questions is, you know, the thing about the challenge for this. I, I've had friends who've done ghostwriting, and you know, usually 
if someone wants a ghostwriter, they're usually some celeb or big money person. They usually have a pretty big ego, and and you know it's really about kind of bringing them down or trying to keep them out of the process to or you know from like trying to control it and that kind of thing. It's the exact opposite with Simone. She's so humble, really is, and she's all about the mission and everyone else. And I can get her to tell everyone else's story and so movingly and wonderfully, but trying to get her to tell about herself is just so hard. I remember late in the process we were we were talking about something about Saint Peter and something I think Francis had said about Peter. And she said she says to me, that's why, you know, I love Peter. That's why I'm named uh, Simone, Simon, after Simon Peter. And I stop, and I'm like, what? I said, what is your, what's your name? She goes, oh, I was born Mary, because my mother loved the Virgin Mary. I'm like, Simone, we've been at this for like six months, and this, I don't even know your, your real first name. I've got to put that in the book, you know? So she's, uh, it's, it's a, if there's any fault, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful fault to have, that, uh, and it was, it was a, a fun and a blessing to be able to be there to try and pull stories out of Simone. But I want to, um, I do want to get to your folks' questions because you have a bunch of good ones. So I'll act, uh, put on my journalist role here and do a little, a little Q and A. No ambush questions. Don't worry, sister. Um, <laughs> Jason Miller of Arlington, Virginia, wants to know, which I think all of us always want to know, what's next for nuns on the bus? Well. Uh, that is really a good question. Um, we are looking at possibly a fall strategy in a few states where there are key elections um, working on uh, the theme of we the people against big money. Now here's the irony that I'll tell our members, but I won't say this out loud in the press, so this is why you're on the inside, so don't go saying this to the press yourself. And don't write this, David. But is that uh, <laughs> is that I need to raise big money in order to be we the people against big money. So it's pretty funny. But uh, what we want to do is in a few key states is to test this message um, and to go to low-income communities and help galvanize folks for standing up for the vote, to vote, to get out to vote, and for those that are not eligible to vote to see how they can help other people vote. Because often Folks don't vote in low-income communities because they need childcare, or they need trouble getting to the. They have trouble getting to the polls, or they haven't gotten their documents in advance. Those are all ways that we can help. And so we think by um, going around on the bus in some strategic places, like we're looking at Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, North Carolina, um, and then some others we're toying with, like Louisiana. Uh, Kentucky, what else is out there? Th those are kind of, oh, possibly Georgia, but that's maybe less. But, but the idea is supporting people standing up to vote. Because if we don't vote, we've lost our power. And so far, money can't vote, but we the people can. So it's about us standing up. So that's our idea. It seems so much, you know, the, the original bus tour that just captivated the, the nation's attention was about, um, you know, about the recession and about people suffering and um, the ongoing economic injustice of, of the system. And it seems like you're also, and, and, and the political system is, is, is turning to concerns about our democratic uh, life together, our democratic system and, yeah. and the, 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 the threat that uh, big money can pose to it. Absolutely. And one of the things that we know that uh, when we first did Mind the Gap, and a lot of our members know that program where we explored income and wealth disparity, is that when you have income and wealth disparity, then you not only have a wealth and income gap, but we have a power gap. And we that is bad for the 100%. And so trying to lift this up that the 100% needs to come together and make a difference, I mean, that's really at the heart of it. So we're hoping to be able to convene in these state tours um, business, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, chamber of commerce, uh, you know, folks from government, as well as employees, folks from low-income communities, labor, where we all come together and have a conversation about the role of government in perpetuating or promoting the common good. And that conversation we think would be key. Sister uh, Jean Ann Campana of uh, Monroe, Michigan, uh, 
writes and asks, what's the most important thing you want to tell us about what you feel that the bus communicated to the nation? You know, what was the most important message you got out there? And also, I'd add, you know, why did it become so big? I mean, this was this was just this was huge. <laughs> I, I think it's a it's a perennial question. What happened? How did that happen? Uh, lightning struck. It was fabulous. And so, I mean, I really think it's the Holy Spirit. So, um, but I think it was the opportunity to use the notoriety that we had. And one of the things that I know is that fi uh, the two things that really are move us forward is radical acceptance of the 100%. I talk about this in the book. Radical acceptance, where we have a heart for everyone. Even the people I have on my mistake of God list. It annoys me, but I, it helped when I realized I was on somebody's mistake of God list. But the, the thing is, we've got to have a heart for everybody. And if we do that, radical acceptance, and fight, but it's fighting for a vision. It's not fighting against. And I use that since we're doing a Google Hangout, I can use, you use the Pope bobblehead. I'll use my, my hands because when we fight against, we push against and get stuck in that position of pushing against. But when you fight for, you can stand side by side and share a common vision of where we're going. And you put radical acceptance and fighting for together, it's fire. It's really fire. It's like Pentecost fire. It's like... Um, it's like the burning bush. And so I really think that the bus became this opportunity for God to flame up in a way that was visible. And where we went around the country was we, every day we went to low-income communities, places that were struggling, folks that were really at the margins, and learned wonderful, amazing, touching stories of their lives as they shared with us. I mean, I'll never forget being in Philadelphia and seven-year-old Mikhail, he, he was going to be a spokesperson at, the, um, at our press conference, and we always let the local organization decide who was speaking. And so um, they picked Mikhail, and I was a little nervous because this little teeny seven-year-old is going to talk to this whole bank of press, <laughs> and he was so cute because he grabbed the microphone when I handed it to him. He had to walk in front of the podium because he didn't show up behind the podium, and he says, I'm Mikhail. And I am a shining star. It was just like, it was so sweet. And he was a shining star because he had learned everybody needed to shed their light so that other people could see them and could come together around the light. And for me, that's like the fire, the, the real reality that we're in this together and that everyone has a brilliance to be shown. And then last year in Birmingham, I'll never forget the guy in Birmingham who... It's probably close to my age, maybe, and at, in the 60s, and said he had this kind of grizzled beard, and he was at our friend raiser in the evening, and he got tears in his eyes when he said, I can't believe that you came. I can't believe that we're being seen down here in Birmingham. I never thought anyone would come. And, oh, it was so profound. So I think some of the things that I learned is that the bus shone lights on people. The bus galvanized folks to care for each other and spread a bit of hope. But it was because we were accepting of 100%. And we were really trying to fight for a vision of who we are. That combination, I think, is key. That's mm. what I'd say. What would you, you say? Uh, what do you think, David? Because you watched it. Hey, it was it was it was great. It was it was catching lightning in a bottle. It was the Holy Spirit in many ways, and I mean, it resonated with where people were uh, and what they were feeling frustrated about. Uh, I think there's a sense that no one was listening to them, and you were listening. And it's also uh, again, I really, you know, I mean, what what uh, what providence the the election of, of Francis, uh, oh. you know, uh, as well, you know, and I think. You know, not to we joke about it a bit, but I think he, you know, he talks like he talks like a nun, basically, and he, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, but again, there are two two things. I mean, you know, for people like me who cover the Vatican for years, for last few years of Benedict's reign, we were writing nothing about how dysfunctional, but except about how dysfunctional the Vatican was, and it wasn't really his fault. You know, it was, it was just terribly run, terrible bureaucracy there, scandal and crisis and the whole thing. Then overnight it turned. It turned. The whole thing turned. 
Francis was elected and his approach and the way he came out and connected with people, all of a sudden, did the, did the Vatican get a brand new PR person who was so brilliant that everybody should hire him? No. A new messenger, you know, formulating the age-old message in, in a new way. And I think, to a degree, that resonates. But also, he does what, what you guys do in the sense that um, it's about actions more than words. Mm -hmm and people connect with that. And it's also, I think, what you're doing now and what the book does so well, it's about um, connecting with the individual. You know, it was, you didn't go to every place people were suffering. You didn't go to every single state. You didn't go, you know, you couldn't, you can't, you still can't, and there's still that suffering out there. But you were able in this very visible way to connect with those people you could connect with, and that re that just resonates so widely. Look at the way when Francis, you know, hugged the disfigured man, and things like oh. that. He's done so often, you know, that's just one person, and yet it's it has, you know, it's just a huge kind of resonance. And I think you all uh, were certainly able to do that. A um, couple of one couple of questions from people about um, what you. You know, the difference between the first bus tour and the second bus tour on immigration, nuns at the border. Um, what did you do? Anything different? Did you learn something different? Were you able to, um, you know, uh, tweak the way you did your the, the thing or, or your message, or were you able to, um, uh, you know, uh, and was it as was it as effective in your mind as as it was the first time around? Um. We're just dealing with some te technical difficulties here, but um, oh, no let's, let's see. We, um, I, I think the thing for me that was so important on the second trip was that I knew people were frightened, but I didn't know the levels of fear. And uh, just a sec, I got to do a technical thing. Ashley, could you turn down my <laughs> speakers? Sorry over? about that. We wish people could have seen. We thought you ha we had it all worked out. Sorry, folks out there. Don't worry. I can just tell more Simone Campbell jokes. Okay. No, no, no. Don't no. you dare. Don't you dare. <laughs> okay. Well, okay then. That'll get those technical questions. We're all right. Um, there you go. Uh, the thing that I didn't know about immigration was the the different qualities of fear that exist out among around the country and the fact that the 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 levels of fear, I know people here without documents were worried about um, you know getting deported but seeing uh, uh, the young woman Ida in, was Ida, in um, Savannah and her fear that her parents would get picked up, she's a DACA kid, she got her deferred action for deportation, she was gotten her driver's license and was all excited about it and she drives her parents everywhere and she says to them don't go off with anybody after work I'm coming to pick you up and if you're going off with anybody call me and let me make sure they're okay because I don't want you getting picked up and I don't know about you but is a 17 year old saying that to her parents I mean when I was 17 my parents would say that to me and <laughs> that level of fear on her part that she couldn't protect her parents and then we met Jackie in Arizona, and her fear was, she's 19, her fear is that she's not doing a good enough job raising her 11-year-old twin siblings. I mean, can you believe that? Both of her parents have been deported. And so every Sunday, she has a phone call with her parents to get advice on how better to care for her, uh, her siblings, their sisters. Mm. And, I mean, at 19... She's going to school part time. She has a job. She's trying to support them economically. I mean, that's huge. That level of fear, I, I never knew. I never knew. Mm -hmm. And then we met um, this wonderful woman, Angelina, who was facing a deportation hearing just because she was rear-ended by somebody in North Carolina. And she was driving to work. She doesn't have a license, but she's been going to work for years. And her kids were terrified that her mom, their mom was going to be deported. Mm. I mean, this is a broken system. And I guess the thing that was hard, harder about the second trip is we went out to repair the brokenness. On the first trip, we went out to stop brokenness from happening or worse brokenness from happening. 
But we had to walk into the middle of the pain. It was it was really tough. It was really tough. Um, the uh, there. Oh, now questions. I can't hear you, David. Oh, I gotta this out. am I? Uh, hold on. Can you? Okay, I think you're okay. Now we got to. Okay, do. okay. I'll just shout louder. <laughs> <laughs> the um, you know, several questions, which is is, is good um, on you know the impact. Um, you know, of the of the trip. I mean, it had great resonance. You know, it's hard to say. You know, what bad things it prevented. You know, it stopped. Stayed. Perhaps it stayed the hands of uh, of some. You know, legislators from doing worse things, et cetera. But specifically on immigration reform, you know, it hasn't passed. And you know, despite the polls of support, you know, you've got this 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 key core. Can, uh, uh, constituency in Congress, it's, it's you know kind of dead set against it. Looks like it's not going to to pass this time around. Um, you know, how do you feel about that? How do you how do you react to that? How do you um, you, know, you went and did this bus tour? You've been out you know pushing for that, and you don't always win. There was the great victory on health care reform, yes, but sometimes you don't win. How do you respond to that as a, as a person of faith and, frankly, as a lobbyist, too? Well, it ain't dead yet. <laughs> what everybody has to know is we've got to get everybody putting pressure on Speaker Boehner and call your member of Congress and tell them to go tell Speaker Boehner to bring it to the floor because we've got the votes. And now most of the primaries are over, and their Republican terror of the Tea Party is what's been holding this up. 32 mm. members of Congress are holding this hostage, and it is wrong. It is immoral. It shouldn't be, and we've got to put pressure on them. So I'm a lobbyist, so everybody on the Google Hangout, the, as soon as you hang up, call your member of Congress and tell them to to go be missionaries to Speaker Boehner to bring it to the floor. It is, um, well, expletives deleted on that one, but it really is possible to get it done in July before the August recess if they put their minds to it. But they're busy putting their minds to fear and other aspects that we've got to tell them it's, un it's wrong. Now the other piece is, if they don't do it, then we have an election in November where they pay a price. And we have got to turn people out to the polls where they seriously have to encounter us because it is that reality of votes that is going to make the difference. So, yeah. uh, yes, we, did, we haven't gotten it yet. We still have time to make it happen. But we have got to put every ounce of pressure possible on it, on them, to make it happen. Um, the other so, but if we don't get it, I mean it's not a huge chance we'll get it, but there is still a chance. Mm -hmm. If we don't get it, well, they've made me mad. So we will get it. I, I mean when you have everyone aligned in favor of it, and you have 32 members of Congress holding it up, that is wrong. And so there will be consequences. They will have to address it, and we will get it done. Mm -hmm. I just don't know when. Hopefully, August before August. Well, I guess you know you have to look at healthcare reform. How long that was coming, and and obviously oh. that's yeah, you know, and that's an ongoing uh, issue too. There's always going to be no big uh, piece of legislation is going to be perfect. So you know, there's always ongoing uh, issues on that. But that was people were really waiting for that for a long time. Well, I hate to say that, but that was a hundred years. So we better do this before a hundred years is up. I think, yeah, the, the demographics are going to demand it, but, uh, you know, in, in the meantime, I mean, you see these people suffering at the border and the kids and the whole thing. It's it's just a very hugely immediate problem, much, you know, much in the way that the first um, bus tour, you know, really highlighted, as you said, that kind of emergency uh, suffering that was going on, you know, that so many people just right. didn't know. Right. Um, and I think there's, that was a good question from Elena Rojikova, I hope I pronounced that right, from San Antonio, Texas, who actually, as, a, as an addendum to that question, said she participated in the immigration rally there, and, you know, just she's frustrated, as so many are, that um, they haven't been able to come up with, as she calls it, a common sense solution. But, I, you know, um, I, as an addendum to that, you know, I just did a profile on um, uh, Cardinal McCarrick, a former archbishop in Washington, who you know, and he's a great nudge, a uh, great lobbyist, and 
you know, he, he told a funny story. You know, he's been in up on the hill to see John Boehner many times, and he said the last time he was up there, he said, I just looked at him and said, John, you could be a hero. <laughs> you know, he said, the politics, everything, it's smart for you, <laughs> you're a Catholic. But, um, so he keeps, you know, he's get, Boehner's getting, you know, getting pressure from all sides, especially on the Catholic front. So, um, there's, um, well, as he should. go as ahead. He should. Yeah. No, I mean, well, it's a real, no, it's I was just going to say that. Go ahead. Oh, can I finish this? That, yeah. that really, as a Catholic, he really needs to step up and it's his cowardice that is keeping him from doing it, that he's more interested in self-preservation than he is in the needs of our nation. And he is a leader for our nation, not for himself. And so some of the pressure that we're trying to put on him is to make that happen. Now, I must say that a couple weeks ago I had a meeting with Congressman Paul Ryan, and Congressman Ryan has been working with Congressman Diaz-Ballard from Florida to try to create, craft some sort of a plan that could lead to immigration reform. And I don't know whether or not they'll actually be able to implement it, but I do know that some people, um, who Catholics, who are in the Republican Party, are trying to make it happen. So um, I think John Boehner needs to get with the program. Mm. It's also, you can argue from the self-preservation angle, too. I mean, look at the demographics. Look at the numbers. I mean, it's, it's not just do the right thing. It's also do the smart thing politically. Uh, politically, economically, uh, for the good of our safety of our nation, for the whole idea of community, for our faith groups, for everybody. This is a good idea. The Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, everybody's out in favor of this. So it's ridiculous that they're holding it up. And the Catholic nuns and the bishops have agreed on it. So, mm -hmm. hey, that ought to do it. <laughs> the... Um uh, well, and you're again, Pope Francis here uh, next year uh, in, in in September of 2015. There, you know, he's going to come to Philadelphia. It's all but confirmed. They, they haven't officially said it, but there's also reports that he wants to go to the border. I think Nogales, where the mm. bishops themselves led, uh, you know, a mass at the wall. Um, you know, if he did something like that, that would be incredibly powerful. Absolutely. When we were at the wall in Nogales. I mean, you look across and you see the city torn apart by this huge wall. And then one of the people from the Kino Center pointed out that just there was this cross uh, with uh, made out of flowers. And they said that a few months earlier that the Border Patrol had shot and killed a young man on the Mexico side for throwing rocks. Mm. Throwing rocks at this huge, huge... what. 40-foot wall? Mm. Oh, my gosh. That was horrible. A mm. um, few questions on uh, advice on, on getting involved and on the stuff that you do and that network does and that, frankly, the uh, Catholic Church does. Some, you know, some frustration. Uh, Virginia Graff of Charlestown, West Virginia, says we don't seem to know how to converse with each other. Too often people just spout out slogans um, and judgments. Um, somewhat, uh, uh, Anne Lawrence of Ann Arbor, Michigan, in addition to simply denouncing systems of oppression, how can we facilitate conversion, and I might add con conversation, among real people without becoming alienating in the attempt? How do we do that dialogue, Simone? Well, it is a key question. And first of all, I th for me, I often think of, you know, wanting to go to the most extreme. So I do things like appearing on Sean Hannity and thinking I'll get someplace, you know. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, I think what we have to be clear about is not to go to the extreme, but rather converse with folks that are more the, what I refer to as the muddled middle, where I feel I am often, is mm -hmm. in the middle trying to craft this way forward for the 100%. And what we can do is a couple of things. One is what I call grocery store missionary work. The fact is in our society, we don't usually talk to each other about important stuff. And um, I urge us, whenever we're standing in line someplace, and we don't do that often, uh, so the only place I know that I do it is at the grocery store, 
so when you're at the grocery store, say to the person in front of you or behind you, hey, have you thought about immigration reform? Or what do you think about raising the minimum wage? I've been worried about it. What do you think? And listen to the response. Because what I've discovered is, maybe just because I live here in D.C., but I think it's around the country, is people have opinions, but we never talk about it in any way. And the benefit of doing it in a grocery store line is that the conversation, if it goes off the rails, won't last too long. So you can handle it for that <laughs> period of time. But we need, we need to have these real conversations about what matters because it's we the people. It's not me the individual. And so I, I think that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is when you do have those difficult conversations with somebody who thinks really differently. Uh, I, I was on a bar association call yesterday. God help me, I'm on a panel with them um, in two weeks. And there's seven people on the panel, and it's about poverty. And a couple people are, one person's from Heritage, one person's from Cato Institute. And they're very conservative uh, think tanks in town. And they're talking about, well, the way we deal with poverty is we support marriage. Of course, they don't have any ideas about how to do that. But they have to support marriage. That's the way we do it. That's where the problem is. It's a breakdown of marriage. And so <laughs> what I tried to do was then to go to the values. What are the values that would be promoted by that? And how do we then move those values forward, though we may not agree on their active solution? And here's the deal. Pope Francis says the way forward is to connect reality, which is the stories of real people are more powerful than theories. And so I keep trying to tell stories because they have a greater power. So I did say to them, uh, I asked on the phone, I couldn't see them because we weren't doing a Google Hangout. So I asked on the phone, well, have any of you practiced family law in a low-income community? And uh, or you might have had some experience of the issues of marriage in a low-income community. It was kind of fun because, well, nobody had, but I did for 18 years. So that was that had. Uh, I think the panel may be better for my experience. I hope. But <laughs> talking to people about values is the key. Um, you know, there there are a couple, few questions here also about, um, uh, you know, the impact on the church as well and some of the internal dynamics as much as you're up on the hill and, and uh, fighting the good fight on all of these um, issues there uh, there's also you know an internal uh, battle in some respects going on inside the church um, between the nuns as there you know the LCWR leadership conference of women religious the Vatican at least under Benedict if not uh, Francis um, you know getting bishops uh, you know to be partners rather than um, opponents. Um, how a bunch of questions on that? Uh, just in a general way, how you know? How do you deal with that? And has there been some evolution in terms of that? Those relationships, uh, especially around the agenda that network you and network are, are promoting. Uh, it's a real good question, and it's still kind of a painful one. Um, one thing that we did notice in the bus trip was that uh, the second bus trip was that five different bishops came to our events um, on immigration reform, and that was huge. I, I have to say I got tears in my eyes when Bishop O'Connell from Trenton came in. That was our uh, first full night, full day on the bus, and. It was so moving to me. I hadn't even, I was sort of blindsided by it because I joke about this, you know, that the Vatican Center really was the Holy Spirit giving us the chance to shine a light on poverty and, and do the bus trip. But for the Vatican Center, the bus would have never happened. So part of me jokes about it, but it also covers uh, the painful truth that I was hurt by it. And all of us, I think, Catholic sisters were hurt by it and shocked by it. And so uh, what we're where is it going? Well, it's still continuing. You did some good reporting, David, about how Cardinal Mueller, in meeting with the leadership conference, used talking points from the far right in this country mm -hmm. to chastise the leadership conference. Um, and then they apparently, according to Sister Janet Mock, had a good conversation with him after that. 
Um, though then he posted it on his website. And I can't tell whether they're doing that to quiet the far right in our country, to say, oh, we're taking care of these ladies. Uh, or they did it because they wanted to undercut the conversation that they had. And maybe you could find out for us and let us know, David, which way that goes. But um, have pen. Uh, I'll get on. Them. Yeah, do get on it. But the thing that's happening in the fall is that we understand that. You remember, there were two issues. There was the Vatican investigation from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Then there was what's called the visitation from the uh, religious. Um, Sickle cell, the, I forget what it's called, but anyway, it keeps track of religious congregations, or religious women and men in the, in the world, and they did a special visitation to all of the religious congregations of women in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we understand that that report's supposed to be coming out this fall. I think that will indicate where do we really stand. What I've said, is, this is appropriate in uh, World Cup time, is that we're like a very small soccer ball in the global reality of the church. And Pope Francis is trying to reform the top. And if he's successful in reforming the top, we'll be fine. And if they send us another letter with another set of questions or another uh, chastising remarks, I'm just going to use Pope Francis as my footnotes to say why I'm doing what I'm doing. So we, we're, I think we're covered, I hope. Good. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. Bob Stewart in Chantilly, Virginia. Father Tom Ivory in West Orange, New Jersey. Go, New Jersey. Um, <laughs> you, know, and, uh, why, you know, inquiring a, a bit about the Francis effect. Do you think, you know, do you think, you know, that he started to turn the agenda of the church or the, to broaden the, the, the platform of the church to include, to make, to put those concerns uh, front and center? Well, let us pray to the Lord he has. Um, I hope so. Um, it seems like there's great resonance among non-Catholics, but around the country I find Catholics more hesitant uh, than non-Catholics. It's really interesting. The, the non-Catholics are like, wow, that's such a great pope you've got. This, we really <laughs> like him. That's wonderful. And, and Catholics say, is he for real? Can we trust him? <laughs> Well, has he done for women yet? I don't know. Um, and so I, I think what we have to do is to take what he's saying about, uh, in the exhortation, Joy of the Gospel, he's got four things for peace building. And I think he's doing all four to try to build peace in the church. Because I think what he sees is, is the, the rifts that have grown up. And so the first one that he says is time is bigger than space. And what he means by that is if you're protecting your turf, you're never going to create peace. But if you're engaged in a process over time, then you create peace. The second is that unity prevails over conflict. People do get tired of the fight eventually. And I think what he's trying to do is to bring people together knowing that the fight's been going on for a very long time. So let's, let's drop it. The third is the reality is more important than ideas, which is the thing about tell the story, don't have a theory about things, which is what I keep telling Paul Ryan. And then the fourth one is uh, the whole is bigger than the parts. But what he means by that is that the, each part is a different shape, each part fits together in another way, and all of the parts have to be included if we're going to build peace. And so I think that's what he's doing in the church. It's not about doctrine or dogma or turf or um, theory or rigidity or leaving people out. He's all about bringing us together and making a whole, making something new. So mm -hmm. I hope he was talking to himself when he wrote that. <laughs> the, um, I want to switch to a bunch of questions on, on writing the book and writing advice, which... Uh, is always interesting, and some of them I, maybe even I can answer. A couple interesting ones uh, from um, Gene Salmon of, of Washington, D.C. Uh, what parts did Simone write, and what parts did David <laughs> I noticed, noticed that sometimes Simone or David uses I for singular, first person singular, and sometimes we. Who is the we? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, basically it's Simone's, you know, it's Simone's words. It's all Simone's words. I sometimes helped her shape them mainly organize them, um, so it wasn't as though, you know, it wasn't really, you know, maybe some of my style in there and things like that, but I really, I really did want to be a channel uh, to her, I really, you know, 
take that seriously, and this isn't about me, and it's really not uh, what I think. There was another question, uh, Fran Leap of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, how did it change my perspective on things? Um, you know, it was very affirming, and I really, I, I frankly, this book, doing this book, and almost the, right after that, the election of, of, of Francis, who cites the Holy Spirit, has really given me a huge appreciation and focus on the Holy Spirit, on the Pentecost, the ongoing Pentecost in the church. That's just a personal, you know, this isn't about me, the book's not about me, but if, if you wanted to know, that's really, I think, the great gift that Simone has given uh, me is, is focusing on that, and she writes about that so, so well. But I think oh, we, we were talking about the first person and, 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 um, and the, the, the we, the third person plural. I think, um, I don't know, Simone, I mean, I, mean I, I hope that wasn't confusing in the book, but sometimes there are personal things that Simone is, is recounting. And then also she's talking about we, the church, we, the people, we, the common good, we at network, we, you know, that. So I think that's, that could kind of account for the shift between the I and the and the we uh, in there, and I hope that's clear enough. If it's not, that one's on me uh, for sure. Someone else. Oh, Gene also no, no, no. Go ahead. We'll put, we'll put in that Roger's footsteps. If Roger <laughs> didn't catch that, then it's his fault. Yeah, he's not on the call. <laughs> I know. Another another question from her. What was it like to talk to Lucille Ball? Before you answer, <laughs> before you answer, that's another one of those questions. Where we're in that chapter on Iraq, we're not going to have time to get to Simone's experience in Iraq, which I was kind of hoping to because it's so poignant and painful, especially for her. There's a great chapter in this book if you haven't read it. Read it about you know really is, is Simone's kind of entry into this global activism, her trip ahead just ahead of the war to Iraq. Really riveting stuff and so poignant now when you look what's going on in Iraq. Stuff that. Simone and those who had eyes to see back then knew was coming, uh, unfortunately, sadly, tragically. But there was a, um, I was talking to her about that chapter, and she was talking about some of the celebrities who were also there. And I said, well, what was it like hanging out with them? And, and this is when we're deep into the book. She said, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm used to celebrities. Her, her first, uh, she'll tell you, and the book tells you, her first assignment was uh, at, uh, in uh, Beverly Hills, a parish in, in Beverly Hills. She said, oh, I did home visits to Lucille Ball when little Ricky wasn't coming to, to religious ed classes. And I stopped and I said, what? I said, you did home visits to Lucille Ball's house? How can you not tell me this kind of thing? Those are the sort of frustrations it was being a ghostwriter with Simone. Anyway, answer the question. What was it like to talk to Lucille Ball? Well, she was like talking to a mom. She was very hmm. gracious. She lived in this huge house. And um, I was scared going up to it, but she was just very gracious. She was very concerned about her son not showing up to religious education because he had evidence that he was going, and it was on Monday nights. And so it was an evening out, and so he had an evening out with his friends that his mom didn't know about. And she was, uh, she herself was quite concerned, quite gracious. Uh, she, as I recall, I think she offered refreshments, but. I, I don't know. I don't remember if I took him or not. I, I don't remember that. But it was a very uh, warm and engaged visit, which actually in Beverly Hills didn't always happen. She was more engaged than a bunch of moms that I met who were more worried about uh, show or how things looked than what was actually going on with their kids. So um, it, it was great to, it, it was a great opportunity to, to see her in that light. Um, and she wasn't exceptionally funny, or and I probably didn't make any jokes either because we were very serious at the time. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you wrote it's very uh, affecting. I think it's not just you know there's sort of the fun celebrity stories I guess one can always like, but as with everything in this book, I think there's a there's and with you, I mean you're a funny, wonderful, delightful person. It's like Pope Francis says, you have to be joyful Christian even amid amid everything. But there's always a, an important point to it, and I think your descriptions of some of the you know, the suffering, you talk about the 100% all the time, and again, it's, you know, all these rich people in, in Beverly Hills and those, and you know, in Southern California, and the misery, <laughs> you know, that you found there, and you, you write about that, um, which I think is very important, you know. Absolutely, and the fact that the top 5% income earners in our country are some of the most stressed people in our nation, mm -hmm. because they're having to look good. They have so much debt. They have so much to look good with 
and wanting to be the top 1% or the 0.1%, but that anguish and pressure then makes them less aware of the needs of kids, less aware of the needs of their family, and it creates really a serious problem for, for everyone they're around. And we've got to pull in this idea that everybody just keeps need, needing to get more and more. But it really was in Beverly Hills where the wealthy folks broke my heart too. And mm -hmm. that is then makes me open to all of the all folks and to know some of the struggles. It, it's gift. It is just really gift. Um, Elizabeth Warren of Oceanside, California, has a few questions on the writing process. But the one I liked, uh, we've addressed some of those, but. She also says, for Sister Simone, if you were to write another book, either on your own or with a writing partner, is there anything you would do differently next time around? And I think her first answer would be, find someone other than David Gibson, but I'll let her speak for herself. Not on your life, not on your life. What would I do differently? Well, I'll tell you, I had a minor mutiny against, I hate track changes in Word. I just hate <laughs> it. Hate it. Hate it. And so David says early on, oh, that'll be okay, that'll be okay. And so I was edit, doing editing and sending him stuff back from the bus, and then it turns out that he never took any of my handwritten stuff and put it into the manuscript because he was too busy with Pope Francis. So uh, I ended up having to do it anyway. So I had to deal with track changes. So I should have just surrendered to begin with. Yeah. Uh, I, I would try to do that if I did it again. I think the other piece is... Um, uh, knowing I know better what I do well and what I don't do well. David's right. I don't write about me well. And I write about everybody else. So I tell stories about everybody else. And if there ever was, somebody was teasing me last night when I was doing a book thing, and they said, ooh, your next book, Stories from the Bus. Well, sort of book one is a lot of stories from the bus, too. But... Um, I think I know that if it requires talking about me, I need help. I need help. So mm -hmm. but that's I a also, people's story. Well, one thing I also well, well, one thing on the track changes and her her Simone's complaint about you know writing me all those notes that was sort of sneaky on my part because what happened was that um, she was on the second bus tour as, as you know putting this thing together, and because I was forcing her to write notes, I have all these wonderful handwritten notes from um, with stationery from hotels and, and, um, and cities all across the, the southern border of the United States where they were going. They're wonderful kind of like mementos. Hey, nobody writes anymore. Nobody writes a note anymore. And I have these wonderful kind of uh, notes. These, these, these envelopes would arrive with these odd post you know, stamp postmarks on them. I'm like, who is this? Uh -oh, <laughs> me? I'd open it up. It's Simone writing from Nogales or something like that. <laughs> But the, um, no, it was, uh, you know, it was a good process. The other thing I would note to, to folks is um, one of the best parts really about this book, frankly, is just the collection of Simone's poetry at the end of the book. Uh, really, that was uh, when people, there's a couple questions in there about, you know, what, how it affected me, this process. I loved her poetry. I didn't know about it. She's never published it before. It's all there, um, and it's great stuff. Um, so I would, uh, that was a gift frankly, as well, and I think it was a great editorial call by Harper to put those uh, collected uh, poems in there. Um, two last questions, and then Simone's going to wrap up uh, with a few comments. One, how can we at Call to Action Western Washington continue to support LCWR and all the work you are doing at Network? That's from Betty Hill of Olympia, Washington. Well, cool. Uh, be a part of us. Uh, if you're on this call, you already are. I think a key in Western Washington is to uh, engage in conversation. Um, if you have any connection with Archbishop Sarton, your uh, bishop who's in charge of the leadership investigation, uh, let him know how you think about us. Uh, you can do some missionary work with him. Just befriend him. Bishops don't have many friends, and we need to let uh, them into our lives too. Um, and I think, um, and the other piece is prayer. Uh, we really need to be ha hold each other in prayer because that keeps us then sensitive to the other ways we're being called to make a difference. So it's not prayer telling God how to fix things, it's prayer of deep listening to where is God calling you. So I just encourage you to do that. It would make a huge difference. Now I wanted to end on a, a 
sort of a tough one, a tough question, but one that you just started answering and that you're so good at answering for me and for others. But uh, Mary Ellen Norpele, I think you pronounce Norpel of Ambler, Pennsylvania, says, tell us some hopeful things. I'm losing heart. And I know that can be a real danger, but you're, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, really, hope is a communal virtue. And so it's not, it, what happens is when we're beginning to lose hope, it means I'm losing my connection with others. And so my antidote for it is to either call somebody or connect or uh, to walk around the office or to uh, give another talk, but it's always in the connection with community. And sinking into our depression, our individualism, runs us into ourselves, and then we cannot find hope because the spirit works in community. So when you're feeling down, call a friend. Email us. Uh, do something to reach out because that's the bridge that will make a difference. That's the important part. That's the key. Well, thanks. So Thank you. That was that's wonderful. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for being my partner. I got, as always happens, I got more out of this project with you than uh, than I put into it. I, I know that for sure. Um, well, we're, we're grateful, David, that you joined us. And I was supposed to do a commercial, and then I thought I'd end with a poem because we didn't get to talk about Iraq, and um, that. Um, the commercial is this, buy the book, <laughs> the proceeds go to my community and to network, so we need it, that would be great, um, but also share it with friends so that we have a chance to talk about this important stuff, because we can create hope changing community together, which is the subtitle. And um, the second thing is uh, join us, if you've got an interest for our uh, business, our roundtables, uh, that I was talking about at the beginning of our conversation uh, for the election project, uh, email us uh, here at Network and we would love to follow up with you because we really need voter turnout this fall. No matter where you are in the country, we've got plans to have a, a nationwide project to really create projects for the 100%. And so with that, let me finish with one of my poems, Jesus Wept. Because I tweeted out today a, um, oh, and follow me on Twitter if you haven't already. I'm close to 10,000 followers, so uh, I, I, I'm very competitive with myself about that, so help me. <laughs> um, but the, the thing is, is, it just makes me want to weep, the displacement of the Iraqis yet again. And this comes from meeting an Iraqi businessman in a in a flight that, read the book, you'll get all the details about it. But this is the poem, and it's called Jesus Wept. And it goes like this. Bold before me, the businessman laments Iraqi life, the impotence, the waiting. Hunching forward, he imparts with strangled voice his secret view. I just want it over, one way or another. We are dying slowly. Let it be over soon. A tear unshed pools in his eye. He murmurs, I have a child. The day my father cried for his daughter's death hides in the shadows of my memory. At her grave, his shoulders hunched against the pain. He held his breath and sealed himself from the vivid world. One lone tear escaped control sliding down the line that marked his mourning. He shuddered once and stilled again, adrift in grief. Be assured that fathers weep for children lost. Fathers weep for dreams destroyed. Fathers weep while the world spins on. Oh, fathers, my fathers, stop this madness. Stop this march to graves and grieving. Leave the tears unshed. Thank you so much for joining us on our first experiment with Google Hangout. Let us know your reactions and hopefully we can connect again soon. And David, thank you for doing this. I, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great.